Morning everybody, um, my name's Sophia Horton. I'm one of the Vice Principals at Q3 Academy in Tipton um, and I'm pleased to be here and sharing some time with you this morning. Uh, I thought I'd just like to start off with a little fun activity which sort of links into what I'm going to be talking about today. So if you look on your screens you should see that there are some pictures of different entertainers and your task is to see how many you can identify and then also see if you can identify the most obscure person, a bit like pointless, so the person who you think other people wouldn't be able to identify. Okay, so I'll just maybe a minute for that, just get us started. So just 10 more seconds, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so let's have a look at the answers, see how many you got and see if you got some of more of the more obscure ones as well. Okay, so some of the more obscure ones that you might not have known, we've got a Sly Stone, Questlove, not sure if you would have identified him. Larry, Larry Graham. And although her sister's very, very famous, were you able to identify Solange Schnells? Okay, so um, what I wanted to talk to you about today was uh, sort of something that sort of comes under the Black Lives Matter remit. Um, there's been a lot in the press recently and um, a lot of people talking about it and it's high on the agenda um, and I just think it's important that we continue to talk about these issues and keep these um, issues high on the agenda. Um, if you have a look on your screen you'll see a picture. Now that picture on the screen although it is of um, a protest. It's not a recent one, that's actually from the 70s, so mid 70s, um, and that is in Wolverhampton where I was brought up. So at the time there were lots of tensions um, about racial injustice um, and those protests happened and there was lots of recommendations about you know, things that um, we should be doing to improve the opportunities for um, black people and ethnic minority people in the city and across the country. However, as we can see, we still have a lot of injustice. So, and that was in the seventies. So I think it's really important, as we can see, that in order to make sure that we do follow the recommendations, that we do see some lasting change, that actually, we keep this conversation going. So I'm going to be talking about something today which is sort of a bit light-hearted but also has um, an important educational um, thing to it as well. So I would like to talk today about the struggles with my hair. So um, as I said I was brought up in Wolverhampton um, at the time although there was lots of racial tensions I ha had a, a nice upbringing in a multicultural area and um, I had lots of friends of uh, multicultural friends it was a multicultural and neighbourhood there were lots of people that mixed together and uh, say so I didn't feel any tensions so um, and actually I didn't really experience any of the racism nothing that I can remember while you know I was growing up and, and in that neighbourhood. It wasn't until I uh, started to apply for apprenticeships and I started to apply for university that I, I realised that there was something a little bit unusual about me when I was outside of my normal multicultural environment. However, one of the things that I had a big problem with when I was growing up was um, of my hair. Um, and uh, I have what you call type 4C hair, so it's very kinky. And like many other black women, in, in, 
including myself, um, your kinks and kills and Afro almost becomes a journey of self-love and self-discovery. Because the Afro hair has systematically been associated with negative stereotypes and such um, things as nappy, unprofessional and unkept are, are some of the negative things that we hear or I have heard about um, Afro hair. So I've just got a little um, video that I'd just like to show you, just a quick clip. What's happened that's so terrible? A catastrophe. Look what happened to my hair. Normally it's straight. I was just walking down the hall when poof, my whole head of hair puffed up just like that. That's a, that's a nappy head at all, is there? I'm going to take that down. Oh, man. man, that's a move. I think this, she's such, she's just such a tiny frame that this hair to me overwhelms her. Like, I feel like she, she smells like patchouli oil. <laughs> yeah, so as you can see, and, and these are sort of some normal things that you, you might hear in a negative way about 4C type hair. Um, however, in 1905, there's a lady called Madam C.J. Walker, and there's a really good film on Netflix about her. Um, she revolutionised black hair care products, and she was the first black female to be a self-made millionaire because of the hair products and the advice that she was giving um, to um, black women about their hair. Um, and her hair products led to the way of re-establishing information that generations of slavery had destroyed. So, um, so what do I mean when I'm talking about 4C hair? So I've got a little video that um, should be able to explain a, a little bit more about what I mean about that type of hair. Or my type of hair, should I say. <laughs> What is 4C hair? Now 4C hair is found in the hair typing chart and it is mostly described as strands that will almost not clump together without the styling techniques. Type 4C hair can range from fine to thin to soft to coarse. It's also densely packed strands. And 4C hair also is tightly kinked and tightly curled with less definition and it also can shrink up to more than 75% of its original length. This is how my 4C hair looks in its wet texture. So this is my natural hair texture with no product, no shampoo, no conditioner. This is how my natural hair looks. And this is how my natural hair looks once it's been air dried um, with no other product in it apart from shea butter. This is just the natural hair texture of my 4C hair. Again, here is my natural 4C hair texture once it's been blow dried, blown out with heat with only natural shea butter in it, so no other products. And this is how my 4C hair looks. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope it helped you. So, um, well, <laughs> I hope you found that interesting. Um, so no one's hair has been um, more politicized politicised uh, the way that black peoples has. Even now we see stories about um, children, young black children and young black girls who've been suspended and put out of school because of the way that their hair grows naturally or because of the way that it has been styled. And even in September 2016, that's only like four years ago, a US federal court went so far as to legally ban dreadlocks in the workplace. And also you see on the screen um, a new story about a boy from Tipton who told his mom that he didn't want to be black anymore after he was sent home from school because of his hair. Um, and I have had similar experiences with my own children who have got a negative um, view about their hair and their hairstyles and, and their hair texture as well. So um, just a, a little video that I'd like to show you, just a very small snippet, a, a sort of a historical context in relation to Afro hair. 
The origin of these stereotypes are better understood through black history, and it goes without saying that the colonisation of Africa from the 17th century onwards to this day has drastically affected ideals of blackness. In the United States, African slaves were stripped of their rich heritage and elaborate native hairstyles, and over generations of brainwashing and enslavement, traditional hair information and routines were destroyed. Previous to slavery, we had hairstyles and, and designs and colours and all sorts of things in Africa. Black people who covered or wore their hair in relaxed hairstyles were considered to be more civilised in Western societies to the extent that in 1786, black women were required by law to cover their hair in the state of Louisiana. Yeah, so that was just a, a little brief um, history and there's plenty of more information um, available online if you if you are interested. Um, and to, to that end, while I was um, looking about Afro hair and during my journey of self-discovery, I found out that what I was quite surprised about was that there was a, a World Afro Hair Day. Now, this was founded by a lady called Michelle de Leon, uh, and she has chosen the 15th of September to be World um, Afro Hair Day. Um, but she chose that for a specific reason, because on the 15th of September, as I said previously, 2016, a US federal court ruled that it was legal to ban dreadlocks in the workplace. Um, so this is a barrier that is not faced by any other hair type in the world. And there is a bias against Afro hair in society, and that can cr lead to or create exclusion, shame, and a feeling of inferiority. And this also has a long lasting impact on health and um, economic opportunity, especially for black women who are pressurized to conform to society norms. Afro hair is rarely celebrated, and uh, Afro hair day is a chance to do that. The first um, Afro Hair Day on in 2017 was endorsed by the UN's Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights as well. Um, so 15th of September, that's the day. And their vision is to create a platform to celebrate and educate people about Afro hair. And that's done through annual events. It's a worldwide network to unite people and to talk about Afro hair in a positive way and also provide some opportunity to educate as well. So to summarise um, and keep the conversation going, uh, celebrate your unique difference and embrace your self image. Uh, embed opportunities to celebrate diversity through the curriculum. Be prepared to listen to people's concerns and don't worry if you don't know the answers, that's okay. Just work with others to find a solution. Find ambassadors and let them share their voice and celebrate World Afro Day on the 15th of September. It'll be coming around soon. It will mean a lot to those of us with Afro type 4C kinky hair. <laughs> Thank you very much everybody and, and thanks for the opportunity to, to share with you today. <laughs>